I made a quarter of my teaching salary in seven hours. And I said, <laughs> like, is this, is this what y'all do? Because, you know, I had been thinking there's no better time than now to try something new because there's all of this momentum. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, how the plus-size endurance athlete behind the blog, Fat Girl Running, yes, that's the name of the blog, Fat Girl Running, how she turned her love for the sport into a career as a fully sponsored professional athlete. So listeners, viewers, I'm going to change things up a little bit. This is normally the part of the podcast where I take you back in time. I take you back to our guest's roots. But before we get into Myrna's story, and believe me, you're going to want to stick around for that because it's extraordinary. I actually want to play a clip for you from the very end of the conversation I had with her. Because I believe this clip perfectly captures just how remarkable Myrna's story really is, as well as giving you like a little glimpse, a little taste of her spirit and her energy. This is, after all, a Brooklyn-raised, black, overweight woman who didn't come from money, but she's wickedly smart. She's creative, she's bold, she's determined. And this is the story behind how all of those characteristics came together to create the Myrna Vader. One of my teachers from high school, I ended up working at that high school. That was my first teaching job. Uh, and now I'm on the board of the school. And, you know, it's <laughs> scholarship girl from Brooklyn is now on the board. I'm still the poorest person on the board, but that's a different story. <laughs> anyway, so, so one of my teachers from the school, I'm still very close to her. I visit her all the time. And she goes, you know, we, we thought you were going to be famous and, you know, well-known, but not for running. <laughs> But then she, she says, well, it makes sense. It makes sense. People don't like you for the running. It's they like you for you. Running happens to be the conduit um, that brings people to you, but it's not the running, you know, and uh, and it's, it's, you are who you have always been, right? You're a performer, you're a speaker, you're creative, Um, you know, you're a writer. You are an athlete and that's all, that's everything that you did in high school and probably before you do now, just it might look different, might feel different, but, but it's the same thing. And you're still a teacher because you, you just have a bigger platform. Hmm. That's like super cool. We're still surprised that it's, you know, you being a pro athlete (laughs) because we never saw that. (laughs) We didn't see that one coming. (laughs) I neither. So yeah, it's been, it's been super cool. It's been, you know, it has been the most joyous and exhilarating and um, anxiety inducing (laughs) ride uh, ever. As you know by now, today's guest Myrna Valerio is the furthest thing from ordinary. Growing up in the concrete jungle of Brooklyn, New York in the 1980s, this former teacher turned runner, turned cross country coach, turned ultra runner, you know, and, and why don't we just add to that list, speaker and author of the best-selling memoir, A Beautiful Work in Progress. Well, let's just say that if I had you close your eyes and imagine an ultra runner, an endurance athlete, the type of person who runs these 50 or 100 mile races, what would you picture? For me, I, you know what, I'm going to close my eyes right now. I'm going to do this. I imagine a skinny old white guy. You know, this white guy is probably like a stockbroker or a head of sales or he's like he's a lawyer or something. But as you know from the previous clip, Myrna is the furthest thing from that image, from the one that I had in my head. In fact, in Myrna's book, she so perfectly captures the challenge those who don't fit the mold face every single day. Let me read this to you directly. I don't normally do this. You know, this is the podcast of me not normally doing things. Let me read directly from her book. When people look at me, they don't automatically see a runner. They don't think, oh, she's a runner or a person who runs marathons or a person who does any kind of exercise. 
I don't let that get to me. I like to surprise people. I delight in seeing people's looks when I tell them that I just finished a 22 mile run or I'm limping stiff because I just finished an ultra marathon. I love that. So to kick off, I wanted to know where did this pro athlete that's breaking the mold with a different look, a different experience, a different perspective, where did she come from? I have actually been an athlete since high school. I actually started playing field hockey when I was 13. It was a new school for me. Uh, I had always wanted to play a team sport. And so I've always been the kind to just kind of go for it and ask if I can be a part of something. I go to the field hockey field and I'm like, they look like they're having fun. So I'm going to join that team if I can. <laughs> and so I go there, you know, and I was, I was a ninth grader. I was, I was, a uh, you know, I was a big girl then, big girl now. And so the first thing we do is run five loops around this field. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, right? Uh, and this, this is a new school. It's a boarding school up in Westchester, New York, uh, about 40 minutes north of the city and uh, everything is new. Like I'm running on grass. I did not have the right shoes on or a sports bra. Like I didn't even know about those things. And I'm like wearing tights. It's like 95 degrees <laughs> and humid, but I'm, you know, but I'm doing it. I'm like, I feel like I'm doing something cool. Right. Uh, even though it's very, very painful. And that, that was our warm up, right. It was almost a mile. And then we had to do a, a, a timed mile a little bit after warming up and doing some getting to know you kinds of games, you know, even though it was really painful um, and, you know, I felt my body felt awful. <laughs> the coach comes up to me while we're, we're doing what used to be called suicides. Now they're called line drills. She comes up to me. I think she's going to say, you know, thanks, but no, thanks. You're obviously not ready for this. You're too slow. You can't run really. Uh, she comes up to me and says, Hey, this is hard, isn't it? I'm like, you know, nodding my head because I couldn't breathe and, and talk. <laughs> I could just picture <laughs> sweat. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> and everything was hurting. Um, and, you know, I'm behind everybody else. And, and she goes, she goes, you know, but you're out here, you're doing a good job. You know, it, I can see that you want to do this. So, you know, keep it up. And then she runs to the next person that's struggling. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I finished the drill the you know, way after everybody did, after everyone else did. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I hung out, you know, I did. How did you, not feel, how did you not feel like garbage, you know, like you're I mean, like comparison, right? You're seeing all these other people you're, you're, you've never done it. You're mm -hmm. not good at it. You have no experience, but in mm -hmm. most cases, when we're, when we're doing these new things, we think that us being bad at it is like a death sentence as opposed to like, oh, we just need to get better. We just need to practice. So like in that moment, how did you not feel just terrible? I mean, I was having those feelings. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to be a part of a team so bad that that was not the thing that um, that drove me to keep coming back. It was I wanted to be part of this team. But but the 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 really crucial point was when um, the coach came up to me and said, you're doing a good you know, it's hard. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. That's all I needed to hear. And that, that is why I'm a runner. Uh, you know, that, <laughs> that is, is why that, you're a professional runner, a runner today. <laughs> um, because she said, hey, you know, this is hard. You're doing a good job. You're here. So that means you want to be here. You're still doing it. Keep it up. And so that's all I needed to hear. And they embraced me as part of the team, even though I did not know what I was doing. You know what? I, just, I didn't know the difference between defense and offense until I got to college. <laughs> I played field hockey on a varsity team all throughout high school. Uh, I just did what they told me to do. But, you know, it, and it was because of being in that, that sport, that very first day, there was so much running. And I was like, this is the thing that I'm really bad at. I'm going to go out the day after, even though I was so sore and my body had never felt like that before. Um, I said, I need to learn how to run because this is what this sport is mostly, of course you have stick, you have a ball, you have the mouth guard and shin guards and all that. And, um, but I was like, it's just running up and down the field all, you know, the entire yeah, time, <laughs> just nonstop cardio. Yeah. And so I knew I had to get better at that. And so the day after that tryout, I roll down the hill. My, my dorm was on the top of the hill. I go down the hill at six o'clock in the morning. Cause I've always been a morning person. Uh, and then I do those same five, six loops around the field. It felt awful. <laughs> I was like, all right, okay, but I just got to get better at this. And, and then I would go the day after and I took a day off and then I would go the, you know, the next day. Uh, and eventually I became a better runner. 
which meant that I became a better teammate, a better athlete. You know, I was able to, you know, sustain two and a half hour practices. Uh, and, you know, I got better at the sport. And, you know, the coaches noticed my improvement. I noticed my improvement. I fell in love with field hockey. And that was it. That was the genesis of Myrna the athlete. Um, I was very lucky to have a coach that was like, hey, you know, we, we want you on the team. Let's work harder. Let's, let's, you know, let's get you, uh, let's get you running. Let's get you, let's, let's work on some sprints, um, you know, without shaming anybody in the process. Yeah. That sounds like, you know, you just said that was the beginning of Myrna, the athlete. And so many of us define who we are because, you know, whether it's family of origin or where you're growing up or someone says something in passing and you just define yourself. You're like, Mm -hmm. I am a, you know, my high school, I remember my high school communications teacher wrote in my yearbook, pleasure, you know, having you this year, Mark, you are such a quick learner. And I was like, I'm a quick learner, you right? Like, I was like, that, wow, right? a great <laughs> idea. learning things so quickly. Um, and so we define ourselves. And so what was the difference though, between Myrna before and Myrna, the athlete? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I had always been a very talented and smart person. People knew me for my brains uh, and I was a musician. So people knew that I could sing um, and play piano, but I never really saw myself as an athlete until somebody said, hey, you know, welcome to the team. You know, you are part of this this thing that we're doing. Um, it's gonna be hard, but you know, we want you. We want you. How many times in your own life has that deep desire to be a part of something bigger than yourself driven you? To be a part of that team, to be invited to that group, to be seen as worthy, as unique, as having something that others value. But this um, no man's land between the need to be a part of something and the fear of not being good enough playing in the middle area. That's Myrna's jam. And it's a strength that I really admire in her. But strength isn't enough to go from being a full-time teacher to a professional athlete, let's be honest. Especially for someone who readily admits that when people look at her, they don't see a runner. So how the hell did that happen? It's scary. It's crazy when you think about it it's yeah. really really crazy <laughs> yeah um and and sort of unprecedented by the time i was in georgia i'd been teaching for i want to say 13 years actually the transition started when i was teaching in new, new jersey right mm-hmm. that's when i had this health scare that i thought was a heart attack but it ended walk, up walk us through that story. if you are a teacher if you're a teacher listening you know what I'm talking about. You got 30 gigs, you got some weekend stuff, you got tutoring in addition to your real job, right? So that's exactly what I was doing. I taught at a boarding school during the week. Is teach- teaching really that hard and though? I mean, because oh, it's, it's only as goodness. hard, it's only as hard. I, this is not a teaching podcast, but it's only as hard as what the teacher chooses to bring to the role. But, you know, but, you know, it is, it is a gift to be in a classroom with, with kids and to be one of the people that helps to mold their minds. But so even though that part is amazing and awesome, there's the, all of the other stuff. And then as a teacher, you know, whether you're in private school or public school, maybe public school might be a little bit easier in terms of, um, they, they have to pay you for extra stuff (laughs) sometimes. Um, whereas in private school, Oh, oh, we see on your resume that you also teach, you're also a music teacher and that you're also a writer. So uh, can you do this activity? Can you do that activity? Oh, we see that you like the outdoors. Can you go lead this hiking thing? (laughs) You know, so there's, there's a lot of stuff. I loved it. You know, I I loved, um, I'm not gonna say every minute of it, but, but I loved it. And and I loved being involved in kids' lives, um, both in the classroom, uh, at, at a weekend trip to Target and, but, you know, and also in the dorms, but I had still had relationships with people from a, a former school that I worked at in Maryland. And so I would visit them every weekend and teach piano lessons, guitar lessons, voice lessons, French, Spanish, uh, composition. I would arrange music and I did that on the weekends and I would come back, back and forth, driving through <laughs> Pennsylvania. And, you know, I thought that was normal. <laughs> you know? Um, and so on one of those trips, I, um, you know, started having chest pains uh, and they're really painful. My kid's in the car. He's five years old at, at that point. 
And I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. And then they, it doesn't go away. I try to like do some deep breathing, you know, you know, moving around my, my shoulder a little bit and, uh, and it doesn't stop. So I pull over. I'm like, I'm having a heart attack. Maybe I should call 911. <laughs> I'm like, you were really no. young though at the time. I was, no, I was 30, 30 something. I wasn't that something young. is still young I, for a heart attack. For, yeah. Trying to remember. I was like, you know, what, what are the heart attack symptoms for, uh, for women? Cause they're different, aren't they? And I'm trying to like, your think and process through numb all of go, this. your left arm goes numb or something. Yeah, and your back hurts or something like yeah. that. I'm trying to like go, go, go through some, uh, checklist in my head. And, um, and I'm like, I'm not calling 911 cause I'm not going to pay the bill. You get to the hospital, you know, and after eight hours, cause they have to keep you there for eight hours. Uh, uh, when you present with, chest pain, um, do all these tests and poking and prodding and whatnot. And, you know, and so the doctor comes in and says, Hey, you know, um, good news. It wasn't a heart attack because all your tests are normal. Um, so it, it seems like you had a panic attack. And I was like, Man, I got a panic attack. Why would I have a panic attack? <laughs> you know? And I told him, I was like, black people have panic attacks. <laughs> and he looked at, he was like, ma'am, <laughs> black people can have panic attacks. <laughs> So that's where I was mentally uh, and, and physically. And so I, I had to follow up with this cardiologist. He tells me that, uh, I, I, you know, in so many words that I'm going to die if I don't change my lifestyle. And that it wasn't even about how much I weighed. It was about this inflammation that I had in my blood. And also that by the sounds of, you know, when I was describing my life and, you know, what I did for work, he's like, so you don't sleep. I was like, no, because I got to do all these things. You know, how am I going to get everything done? And so, and so he's like, you've got to sleep. That's, yeah. that's going to kill you. Right. Yeah. And uh, he's got you. He in, said in that moment, I've, I've heard so many people, gosh, my wife's grandfather was a mm-hmm. perfect example, smoked cigars his whole life, whole mm-hmm. life, five cigars a day, ends up getting lung cancer naturally. And mm-hmm. is told like, if you do not change, you will die. And still chooses not to change, chooses not to listen, chooses not mm-hmm. to hear. And so in that moment, when your doctor says, if you do not change, you will die. Why were you open to listening at this point in your life? I had a five-year-old, <laughs> you know, also like I had, the, there were all these other things that I wanted to do and I was young and, you know, and I left there and he was like, well, you know, also like if you could lose 15 pounds, that'd be great. I'm like, all right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. And so, but, but the very next day, like, I was like, okay, I'm going to get on a treadmill. Cause I hadn't, hadn't been on a treadmill for around three and a half years. I hadn't been running or anything. And I had always been running. I'd always been very, you know, physically active. Um, you know, I uh, always maintained a certain level of fitness, but when I got when I started teaching at that particular job and you know, things had fallen apart because I was so busy all the time with work stuff. Hmm. Uh, and I was also in grad school. I forgot to say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> <grad school>. so, <laughs> so, you're, so you're in grad school, you're traveling uh, two States over every single weekend. You're teaching all of these things and you're living in a boarding school and you're a mom and your wife and all of this other yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. So sure. um, you weren't sleeping and having panic attacks. Right. Well, yeah. And, um, but that's, that, that was normal to me. Like if I wanted to do well at my job and I, and I wanted to kill it, then that's what I had to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that, that visit with the cardiologist and also the, the, the doctor, the emergency room doctor saying, Hey, you, you had a panic attack that, you know, those two moments were very cathartic for me. Cause like, you know, it was, the message was very clear, slow down slow down. So that was it. That's all I needed to hear. And I got on a treadmill and the rest is history. We all have these types of moments where we're just, we're pushing too hard. We're stretching ourselves too thin. It feels like if for a single second we stop, the house of cards that we've been building will just fall apart around us. And so you feel compelled to try and keep up, to stay on top of it. And if you don't, I mean, honestly, if you don't do it, who will? You know what I'm talking about, right? And so the idea of making space in your life for the things that you want to do. In Myrna's case, it was exercise. It was her health. It was sleep. Come on. You heard how busy she was, right? (laughs) But the idea of making space for your health, for your passion, your craft, your art, developing those new skills, whatever it is, it feels almost impossible to make room for these things as important as they may be. So I wanted to know. Where others fail, where I fail, how did Myrna succeed? How did she make space? How did she make these changes? 
the thought of I will die if I do not do this. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a wake I up. I prioritize <laughs> my life. Um, that well, that was the primary motivator. <laughs> and then it was also, but what it also was permission for me to drop something mm-hmm. um, or just like reorganize. And so I looked at my schedule. I looked at my schedule and I would get up at five o'clock anyway. I would get up 4.30 actually and do work, right? Uh, because that is when I, or back then, <laughs> that was when I was most alert. Uh, my brain was like on fire in the morning. Um, and, and I could think clearly also I could be by myself and you know, have a kid, you know, running into my bedroom. And so, you know, I didn't have any of that. So like, that was like prime time for me for myself and to get things done. And so I said, you know, I'm just going to get up like I used to do. I'm going to get up at four 30 and I'm going to work out. And then I had to ask myself, do I really need to work on this particular thing this early in the morning? Or can I use my free periods during the day to do that? And so that's, that's all I did. I just shifted some things around. Um, I still worked hard, but, but the act of just getting up and, and, and running again, uh, or walking or doing Pilates, which I hated. But just <laughs> you know? getting back to your thing, like the yeah, thing that, that fires you up. It was a game changer. I felt better. You know, it took a couple of weeks for me to feel better. Right. And that's the other thing, you know, like I knew it wasn't going to be instant. I knew I was probably going to be in pain for the first couple of weeks. I was going to be sore. My knees were going to hurt. My hips were going to hurt. And that's exactly what happened. But I knew that eventually it would turn into something else uh, that I would feel better. And so so I gave myself that grace. I I knew that like starting again was not going to be fun. (laughs) And it wasn't. But I was like, you know, I'm going to give myself a couple of weeks. And that's what I did. And it's, you know, it's really amazing. Like by just simply being out there and like people watch you, people are watching all the time. They're like, what is it that you're doing? Like you're, you're, you're way more alert and just like, you're not tired at five o'clock in the afternoon and, uh, and, and dragging, what are you doing? I'm like getting up at five o'clock in the morning or four 30 and working out. Right. And that's all I did. I didn't change except for like switching things around in my schedule and change anything else. So it wasn't um, even this big major no, it was thing just where you have to like throw everything out and tear everything down. No, it was just no, it was, a tweak. I only started with a mile. I was like, I, um, and I know that's very cliche, but that's what I could do. I was like, let me just work on this mile because that first mile sucked. <laughs> and I just want to make that better for now. And so I did. And eventually when I was able to run the full mile, then I added on more mileage. And then, so I did a 5k, a local 5k a couple of months after I'd started running again. And I was like, well, my time was awful. <laughs> and that's how endurance athletes think, you know, that time was awful. I want to do better. So let me work to make that better. And so, and then I got obsessed with doing 5Ks. And then I, you know, I was like, well, what's the next thing? 10Ks. What's the next thing? Half marathons. And so over the course of, of two years, two and a half years, I became a runner again. Uh, and that became, again, my identity at school. Oh, Miss Valerio, she runs. She's the runner. Like, if you have any questions about running, ask her. Yeah, you know, she knows all the right routes. She, yeah. you no. Know. And then they asked me to coach at the school I was at. And that was just a whole other level. I was like, I don't know anything about coaching. I had to take coaching classes and stuff. Um, but it was an, a really cool way of enrolling more people into this idea that you could run as a lifestyle. Sure, you can compete, but it's this really cool lifestyle um, that you can have. And it doesn't really take any equipment. What is it about the lifestyle that you like? It's, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've become a runner myself <laughs> over the last few years. I've lost a lot of weight and I've gotten mm-hmm. fit. And then I, you know, I, I'm very used to 5Ks now because I run it like four or five times a week with strength training. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I do 10Ks if I want to take 50 minutes to run. And then on Friday, just as Friday, I realized I've never run um, very far. I was speaking to Zach Bitter last week. You know, oh, wow. and, uh, and so I was speaking to him and I was like, I've never run more than 11K, I realized. Like I just never thought to. Mm-hmm. And so on Friday morning, I'm like, I'm going to run a half marathon. <laughs> and it was like the first, <laughs> the first 14 or 15 K was so easy. And I'm like running along and I'm like, what's this wall people talk about? And then 16 K mm-hmm. my knees start to hurt. And then 18 K 
every step Mm -hmm. just really hurts. And then by 20 K my like left knee gave out. Like I just, I had to walk the last kilometer because I could not, every time I started to run, I just couldn't put pressure on it. And I was like, how did that happen so quick? And so (laughs) it's, it's, I can, I can see why people can like want to become runners, but you talk about a lifestyle. So it's interesting, right? Like you start to, you, you start for health and for uh, mental health, and then it becomes a bit of an obsession, and then it becomes a lifestyle, then it becomes a career. And this is so, this is so cool. So, what is it about the lifestyle that you love? It's this thing that makes you feel good, right? Uh, not necessarily in the moment all the time. Um, <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> but the, <laughs> the whole idea of endorphins, but that stuff is true. Um, and it's and it's added so much to my life that it just became a part of what I needed to do to. Um, to feel good about myself again, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, being outside gives you a lot of things, you know, it's all scientifically proven that time outside, you know, can lower your blood pressure, can help lower, lower your blood pressure, um, and increase endorphins, make you happier that all that's, and that it did all that stuff. It continues to do all that stuff for me. Um, you know, you start going longer and you start discovering things about yourself. Oh, wow. Like I didn't know I could do 10 miles. Wow. Like, what else can I do? And that somehow filters into other things. Like it, you know, it starts, you know, what else can I do? If I did, if I, you know, went down this trail, what am I going to find? So there's like this curiosity um, that is, I think, implicit in any sort of endurance sport. Like, what else could I do with my body? What else, <laughs> what other hard things can I endure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just between you and me, just us, right? Let's talk about Myrna's career for a second here. As of this recording, she's been featured on the NBC Nightly News, CNN, the CW Network, and in an REI-produced documentary called The Myrna Vader. Love that. But more than that, she's also a past National Geographic Adventure of the Year, a Garmin Woman Adventure, and she was featured in the New York Times. And... She's been on Rich Roll's podcast, countless other podcasts, and most recently on the Kelly Clarkson TV show. So clearly her career took off. So again, this is just between you and I. I I had to ask her again, how the hell did that happen? So in in the midst of all this, like sort of rediscovering running um, and and becoming an endurance athlete, I started a blog called Fat Girl Running. Mm. Doesn't that girl, I run, it still holds true. In it, I talked about, you know, my experiences as a larger runner, as a plus size runner in a field of mostly thinner endurance athletes. And yeah, I told stories, uh, positive stories. I told race, I I wrote about the various events that I had done. uh, And also the other things that people would say to me, both positive and negative. And, and, And and a lot of the negative things were, you know, maybe you shouldn't run. Maybe you should just go swim. Maybe you should play tennis. It's better for your knees. I'm like, have you played tennis <laughs> before? <laughs> yeah, a lot of lateral <laughs> movement. <laughs> um, uh, maybe you should just go on a diet. Maybe you should just do this. And people would say stuff and, and, and write stuff to me all the time. And, um, and, you know, there was one post that I did and I was really, I was in a bad mood and I ran five miles this one day. And I'm thinking of all the things that people had said to me, you need a new wardrobe. You need this, you need, you know, like for all the things that you do, you do, you should dress better. <laughs> you know. And these things are flowing through my head and my back is hurting as I'm running this five miles around the campus in Georgia. So I write this in my blog, uh, you know, with today's standards, you know, according to t- today's standards, it didn't go viral, but it got a lot of views, right? It, you know, fell upon the eyes of a Wall Street Journal reporter, Rachel Bachman, who who contacted me once, uh, you know, one day while I was sitting in a meeting I didn't want to be in. And, and, <laughs> and I mean, are there any meetings that we want to be in? Anyway, so um, and she said, hey, I love your blog. I'd love to talk to you about this idea of, you know, you know, doing fitness, um, not with, without the, the emphasis on losing weight. And I'm like, that's my jam. All right, let's do it. And so we talked, the article goes out the next week. Uh, and then I start getting eyes, more eyes on the blog, including runner's world. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly people are talking about, can you be fat and fit? Can you, uh, can you be an endurance athlete and be fat? Can you do this? You know, um, so many, so many interesting questions that, 
Yeah. Like, and like then, we bump, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we yeah, bump up yeah, against yeah. this. So like, like even your blog, right? Like fat girl running. There's so much tension around the word fat. Yeah. Now, you know, I was overweight most of my life. I'm very comfortable saying I was fat. Mm -hmm. My wife gets mad at me because of our kids, you know, and what, and this and that, but you know, throughout this interview, you've said large, you've said plus size, you've said lots of things not to define yourself as fat, but your blog is fat girl running. And so right, there's and, like this, yeah. there's like this tension mm -hmm. with, between like, I don't believe that people should just love who they are. I don't, I'm not comfortable with that notion. And that has nothing to do just with your physicality. It's just like, I don't think people should just go like, just love yourself. That doesn't feel like enough to me. It doesn't feel like progress to just accept the things you're unhappy with, the things that you don't like, the things that make you upset. Mm. And so it's just like, I just can't get on board with people saying like, like, I, I like your message. I like that you can exercise, you can push yourself, you can challenge yourself without the goal of weight loss. But if you're unhappy with how you look, how you feel, how you, how, how your, your physicality, the way the clothes fit, the way that, you know, I hated going to weddings because I hated putting on a suit because I had to stand up straight. And, you know, so I didn't feel terrible about myself and, you know, all of the things that I've benefited from losing weight, getting fitter, building more confidence, I believe so strongly in, and mm -hmm. I don't think that people should just accept who they are if they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you deal there, with that on? If on, you are unhappy with your body, go ahead and change it. Okay. I was not unhappy with my body. The only thing I was unhappy with, or maybe I wasn't necessarily unhappy. Uh, you know, I just, I didn't feel good. And, you know, I did lose weight when I restarted running, but then I very quickly plateaued. Um, and, and that was fine. You know, like I didn't have any issues with uh, the way I looked. I was, I was always comfortable with the way I looked. I don't have a problem with be, people being comfortable, but it, like, if you want to change, go, go ahead and change. That's, that's on you. But unfortunately, the whole diet industry and weight loss industry is so toxic. Um, and, you know, it gets people to like be on these like yo-yo diets and this and that. And then they are so, they, there's so much body dissatisfaction that they can't think of any, they can't think about other things. It's problematic. Right. And so that's, which is why, like, I have this, I have this uh, Facebook group called fat girl running. And, you know, as like, we, we don't talk about diet culture. We don't talk about weight loss here. If you do that, that is, that's cool. That's on you. We're just not going to talk about it here because it leads people into these like deep, dark holes of, of hating themselves, um, which is not healthy. Um, you know, if, again, if you want to change, if you're working towards that in a healthy way, absolutely do you, but like, but I'm not interested in, in, um, I'm not interested in people changing for society's sake yeah. because other people don't like the way they look. I am not interested in that at all. But if, if you have some sort of personal conviction that, you know, if you change your body in this way, you are going to, you look the way that you want to look, feel the way that you want to feel absolutely go do that. I don't want to hear about it in my group because there are other spaces for that. I want to talk about, that. <laughs> I want to talk about, I want to talk about how you did on my, your last 5k. I, I want to talk it. about what your training looks like. I, I don't care about your diet. You know, um, I don't, you know, I don't care about what, I, and there's just a lot of commiseration, you know, so, so and so like I was out doing a 5k and, and somebody was like, you know, you shouldn't be out here running fat ass. Like, you know, like those are the kinds of things that have permeated our culture because like when you see, when people see people like me out running or on my bike, um, sometimes they're like, whoa, oh, wow. Like, wow, I, you know. <laughs> That's what's so dynamic about you. It's that, it's that you are super, super unique, right? Being, being a, a larger black woman in a sport that is mainly dominated, I believe, by like skinny old white dude lawyers or something. And, you know, you have, you have that thing, the fact that you're not focusing on diet culture, the fact that you are focusing on the sport as opposed to doing it to lose weight. And you're very well spoken and you got a great personality, all these things. That's what makes you so unique. And yet, I think most people in your situation, most of our listeners, most of the people who want to do great things, they would, they would never take that step. They would never put themselves out there because they feel so much like a fish out of water that they wouldn't have the courage to go do that. 
But that very thing that makes you different and unique and you're bumping up against all these challenges is the th- reason people gravitate towards you. Um, you know, I would have to disagree with you and say I'm, okay. I am not unique, right? I have a group of 16,000 people that are mostly fat who all do races every weekend, um, who train, who uh, do other sports, who go to the gym. Um, it may seem like we're unique because you don't see us represented in media or advertising, et cetera. You don't see that um, because there's this like very sort of aspirational body, aspirational type of person, aspirational kind of athlete that is, you know, pushed over and over and over again. Um, so we're out there. We're definitely, if you go to a marathon, you know, to like the New York City Marathon, do you know how many different kinds of bodies and races and genders and heights? I, so it's so interesting. You, yeah. you went straight to the sport. What I meant w- was more like going pro. So there may be 16,000 people in your group. Mm. 16,000 people aren't on the New York Times and, and aren't being sponsored and aren't being featured and aren't taking all of the negativity <laughs> and the hits, right? <laughs> true, true, true. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I was kind of thrust into this thrust into the spotlight. Um, and that's, you know, I, I thought it wouldn't last. I said, Oh, that's cool that I was in wall street journal. Very, very cool. Oh, it's cool that I was in runner's world. This is all going to die down because I'm just going to go back to teaching and, um, you know, do my, do my education thing. You know, eventually I'll write a book. I do want to write a memoir. That's what I was in, in grad school for. It was for writing. And um, yeah. And I'll, y'all continue singing. I'll do this. You know, I'm going to have a great life. I had a great life, a really great life. But then, you know, all of these things uh, continue coming at me. It has not stopped by the way. (laughs) That, uh, that all started in 2015. It is 2021. Uh, right. Right. It's 2021. <laughs> it's 2021. Believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's been, it's been a minute. Right. And, um, it never slowed down. And so after the runner's world article came out, um, I had to hire a publicist because what a strange I, experience. it was eh? so strange. And, I, and my friend, my friend, um, who was one of my mentors, <laughs> uh, I would say in business, uh, said, Hey, you know, it's time for you to hire a publicist. And I'm like, I don't, for what? Like, why? I don't need a publicist so it's to help you with all of the queries and the, and the requests and stuff. I was like, this is going to blow over. And he's like, I don't think it's going to blow over. I think you <laughs> hire a publicist. And so he, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. But he made some connections anyway. And, you know, I talked to her she, and I was like, you know, this isn't going to blow over. So if you could just help me out for the next two months, as I do all these podcasts and interviews and uh, videos and stuff, that would be great. Uh, she's like, oh, it's not going to blow over. <laughs> she, Everyone around your life is like, and I'm like, yes, there's, it there's is, magic but, here. There's something you know, here. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah. And it just, it never stopped. And, and the first sort of inkling I got uh, that it wasn't going to stop was like, you know, I got a, a query from a brand that I'm currently with that I'm currently partnered with now, Merrill. Um, they wanted me to do a commercial. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And so, you know, we did all this work and stuff and, and, and I was so excited about it. I didn't even really care about the money, but it was a lot of money, right? It was a lot. It was way more. It was about two thirds of my teaching salary that I would be able to make in a week. And which was cool, but I wasn't even really concerned about that. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, it didn't, it fell through, it didn't happen. But Merrill kept me on as an ambassador. I didn't know what that was. I was like, free shoes, free clothes. I'm good. That, you know, that's amazing. And, you know, that was one of the things I used to dream about when I was on the treadmill at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I was like, I wish I could get some free clothes and free shoes because there, there was almost nothing that, that at that point was built for somebody who was plus size that was actually athletic wear, not athleisure. Like, yeah, seriously. Um, and so, um, and so I was like, ah, I wish, you know, as toxic as she was, I was like, I wish Jillian Michaels would come around the corner into my office and see that, you know, I'm a fat person, you know, I'm not slovenly, I'm not sloppy. And none of those people are, you know, that's just what, what the image is that they were promoting on TV. And, you know, I, I'm working out and, and, and here's what, you know, I'm on the treadmill, I'm running, I'm not crying or vomiting, you know, and <laughs> 
And it's like, I, I wish you would come and see this. Right. And this is like going on in my head. Right. So when that happened, I was like, oh, wow, that's like a dream come true. I get these like free clothes and free shoes. And I don't, I, I don't know if people realize what a step it is. You know, <laughs> uh, I get sent books from publishers and I love it. <laughs> like, like I love, I'm like, oh, opening the mail. And I was like, look to my wife, I'm like, look, another book. And it's just like, I get a little letter, a form letter and all this stuff. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Something super cool. And it's such a small milestone, but for anyone who's putting themselves out there, mm -hmm. that little bit of recognition that what you're doing is being seen and that mm -hmm. it matters. Mm -hmm. and so like, I can just imagine like getting the shoes, getting the, you know, like, you know, open the box. You're cool. like, people are giving me stuff. Yes. <laughs> Now I'm like, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Don't put that out there. <laughs> like, um, but you know, it's, so that was, that was really cool. And then, you know, I, other companies started chiming in, Hey, we'd love to send you an outfit. We'd love to send you a book. We'd love to do this. And then, um, and then I was reached out by um, a literary agent um, two of them actually. And, um, Hey, you know, we love your blog and like everybody's reading my blog and it was not, it's not even that good. <laughs> the reviews, no, Cause I didn't have to edit it. I didn't have to submit it to anybody. So I would just write stories and there's probably spelling mistakes and stuff like that. But they're like, we really love your blog. We love your, the voice of, of your writing. And I, I'm a writer. So like, I knew what they meant. I'm like, Oh, thanks. Are you considering writing a book? Oh, you know, maybe in a couple of years. No, I, we, We'd love to see a book now. And so, yeah, 2017. We'd love to see story. a book, a memoir. Long, exactly. So, long story short, this is in 2016. Long story short, hey, I signed with a literary agent. I started writing my book. My book uh, is published in 2017. And I wrote it during the summer uh, between uh, two teaching years. And so, um, that's all going great. Uh, it, you know, was the best uh, on the bestseller list for Amazon for a couple of weeks super awesome. Again, I'm like, part of me is like really compartmentalizing all of this other stuff that's going on in my life. All of the, oh, now I'm a published author. Oh, I've been on TV. Oh, I've been on this show. I've been on that show. Uh, I've done so many shoots now. Like, um, did it all I get free like stuff it all the time. Easily to you? Like, uh, you, like you, cause you, you worked, like you, you worked, you put in the years, you put in the uh, effort, mm -hmm. you stepped into the spotlight, you have a voice mm -hmm. as you said, like, like you took the hits. And so at a certain point it, and, and the momentum's catching on and, and, and mm. people are gravitating towards you. Did you, did you own, like, did you say like, this is as a result of how awesome I am and how much work I've done? Or were you just like, I got lucky. You know, part of me was like, I got lucky. Okay. <laughs> like, I also wanted to dispel the myth that this was an overnight thing. Right. I'd been writing the blog since 2011. I'd been working on my own physical fitness and health for, since 2008. Um, I was still working as a teacher. <laughs> and so um, so there was a lot of there was a lot of hard work that that, you know, went into this whole overnight success that, that people think it was. Um, and even then, like it took from 2015 to 2017 for me to like for me to realize that, oh, oh, like this is real. Like I, I have been working really hard towards this. Um, and let me, I, I think I want to try something else. And I think, you know, all of these things keep coming at me. As I said, it never slowed down it, and it still hasn't till today. And, um, and the thing that the, the straw that broke the camel's back was getting a gig with JC Penny. I had done some social media work for them and, and now like it was becoming a regular thing for a company to ask me to do some social media stuff. And I was like, okay, great. And they would pay me and it'd be great. Uh, this is how I paid for my kid to go to camp. <laughs> 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 and so I made a quarter of my salary of my teaching salary in seven hours. And I said, is this what people do? <laughs> like, is this, is this what y'all do? Like, uh, you know, people who do TV and who do commercials. And I said, whoa, because, you know, I had been thinking now is the time for me to move on. Now is it like there's no better time than now to try something new because there's all of this momentum. And also. So so that was the first thing. Right. I was like, oh, I need to do something else, <laughs> yeah. not just for the money, but like if I could continue doing what I'm doing, you know, being a public figure, writing books, 
um, t- speaking to people and 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 inspiring and motivating people to do something different, to move in a different direction, to um, grab onto something. You know, we talked earlier, and like I just grabbed onto that, and that became my identity. To grab onto something and just do something that they need to do for themselves, and I, I want to keep doing that. I think it's really cool. You know, before the momentum dies down, I you know I can always go back to teaching. I love teaching. Teaching is in my bones, that's you know? Like, that's like the number one response I hear from people on the podcast is like, I could always go back to X, like whatever the previous mm-hmm. career was. Like I could just mm-hmm. always go back to it. But I know that I face this. I know that others face this all the time. There's this feeling that you're standing on the edge of a cliff. You mm-hmm. know, like, I don't know if you've ever cliff dived into water or not before, but there's a feeling like you're standing on the edge of the cliff and you have this this anxiety, this mm-hmm. excitement, what could be, but at the same time, there's this feeling of just, this is bananas. Like who does this? Like who, <laughs> who, who, who does this? And, and what if it doesn't work out? And what if I I'm completely crazy because I thought there was solid ground and I step out and it's just nothing. It's just I have a very fitting analogy for that. Yeah. 2017, the same year. In September, I am, and this is before the whole JCPenney thing happens. I am, I did a lot of work with Tough Mudder um, back when they weren't owned by Spartan. And Merrill was actually their presenting sponsor. So I get invited to a test obstacle, an obstacle testing event where these are new obstacles. No one has done them. This, it's in a secret location. They, they like drop you off at some place in Pennsylvania where they're building these test obstacles. And the last one is this obstacle that's a 28 foot wall where you just jump off onto this inflatable. You jump, you and you you have to climb the wall. You, you uh, so I think we laddered up. We might've laddered okay. up where there was like a, a, a rope web or something like that, that you had to climb up. I think it was a ladder, right? And so I'm the last one and because I looked at it, I was like, oh, no, nah, man, like I, I'm not afraid of heights. I am absolutely not afraid of heights, but I don't like jumping off of things like you will. You will not see me cliff diving. You won't. see. Me. <laughs> so when I say I don't know if you've ever cliff dived before, but so, I mean, that's not happening. <laughs> off, off, OK, <laughs> let's continue. So I'm the last person. And so I get up there. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, nope, I'm going to climb back down. But they had taken away the ladder. Uh, and of course, you know, all of this is on film. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I start freaking out. And I, I don't freak out a whole lot. Like there are very few things that scare me except for thunder. And I hate thunder. That's a, you know, that's another thing. But anyway, so I'm, I'm on the edge. I'm literally on the edge, you know, not afraid of, afraid of heights, but I was like, I am not jumping onto that inflatable. <laughs> I'm a big girl. I'm going to sink to the ground. You know, like there's all this. And they're like, just jump. I'm like, I, I can't just jump, you know? And so the guy, his name was Noah, that's up there. <laughs> um, he's like, do you, wanna, do you want me to come to the edge with you? And I'm like, yes, please. I was like, will you jump with me? He's like, nope. I was like, well, I'm just going to climb down. He's like, the ladder's gone. And I'm like, in my head, I'm going to have to jump off this effing thing. Like all these people are watching. I'm just going to, but then I started, you know, intellectualizing a bit. Did anybody else die? No, everybody's down there. They're fine. They rolled, they, they jumped off. They, and then they rolled off the thing. No one's injured. Everyone's like, you can do it. Yeah, it's great. You know, we've seen you do other things. And I'm like, oh my God. And then I just had to stop thinking about it. I just had to just go. Cause I knew they were not going to put that ladder back um, because they're like that. <laughs> so uh, I do not remember the three or four seconds it took, like when I was in the air, I, I don't remember, but I, I did it and I rolled right off the inflatable thing. And I was like, did I just do that? <laughs> oh my God. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. No one's, I'm not dead. <laughs> like, <laughs> fine. And that was it. And I was like, okay. Do I want to do that again? No. Can I do it again? Yes. Because no one died. I think that's the spirit that I took with me when I decided to leave teaching. And the last thing that really, really, in terms of of like pushing me over the edge, the last thing that pushed me over the edge was a kid, 
a student who wasn't even my student. He wasn't in any of my classes. He wasn't one of my cross country athletes. He wasn't one of my musical students. He comes into my classroom. It's a, a free period for me. Comes into my classroom. His name is Chris. He goes, Miss Valerio, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, what's up? Cause I'm like, I always like say stuff and do stuff. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes people are like, Miss Valerio, I don't really like when you, when you told me that one thing, you know, I didn't like your tone of voice. And I was like a little scared about what he was gonna say, but he's like, Miss, well, Miss Valerio, I, you know, and he started out like this. He's like, I, I really like you. I, I you know, actually I, I love you, Miss Valerio. He's like, but, but you don't belong here. And what I mean by that is that your star is rising and you need to go follow it. Again, like, I love you, Ms. Valeri, but I think, I think you need to be doing something else. Wow. And I'm like, he's like, that's all I want to say. See you later, Ms. Valerio. And I'm like, completely stunned. Um, and you know, I started tearing up. I was like, whoa, this wow, this kid is like reading who I am so deeply and, and, you know, heeding the messages from the universe (laughs) and the messages from all of the things that I've been doing and coming to give me this message. Right. And I was like, whoa. And that was it. That was it. Like I, I, I knew I had like sort of kind of made the decision to not continue on. But that was it. Like this kid says to me, who doesn't even like interact with me on a daily basis, your star is rising, Miss Valerio, and you need to follow it. Whoa, whoa. And that was it. And like right after he came into my office, I made an appointment with my head of school. Go into that appointment. He's like, I already know what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> we knew we couldn't Everyone hold on. Everyone could see it. Everyone could see it. And I, and I was fighting it at every instance. I was like, I'm a teacher. That is who I am. And I'm going to keep running and I'm going to keep coaching. And sure, if these things keep coming at me, I will do those things. You know, my school had been very generous with me and they, they'd given me a lot of time off to travel. They're like, this is so cool because like, the kids can see it happening in real time. Yeah. You know, you have these talents and they are being utilized and you are working really hard. Um, just tell us when you're going to be gone. <laughs> so, yeah. That is so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It was so cool. And that, you know, that leap was really scary, you know, because as you said, I didn't have any health benefits. I didn't, I had no idea what my salary would salary would be. But as soon as I made that decision, things just started happening. Hmm. Like I, there, there was more room in my brain, more room in my spirit to sort of accept things, uh, you know, and I'm not like super woo woo, but like, there's some parts of me that are like, you know, when you, when you, when you speak things, they start happening because, yeah. be, because you start changing your habits, you start thinking differently, you start looking for other opportunities, you know, and, and, and they will come to you, right. It might not be immediately, but, but they do. And then my school also realized that. And so they said, Hey, you know, your kid can stay here for another year. Yeah, uh, it was, It's a private school, very expensive. He can be a boarder. He can stay in the dorms while you figure your stuff out. Oh, that's so amazing. A gift, you know, a gift. One of, one of my favorite sayings is, it's kind of a funny story. And whenever you ask people how they met, you know, when, you, when you're like, when you're a couple, you can only be friends mm-hmm. with other couples, it seems. That's a rule, apparently. <laughs> but, you know, when you ask people how they met, oh, it's kind of a funny story. Or how did you get into this career? It's kind of a funny story. And looking back, there's always these like twists and turns in life and these dots mm-hmm. that connect to allow this funny story, this kind of weird thing that happened or this series of events that led you to this magical, beautiful, amazing thing. And um, what I love so much about what you just shared is it just, it just hits me as like, it's kind of a funny story. I didn't want to do it. I did. I kept, and everyone in my life and they saw something and at a certain point we have to listen Mm. to what people are speaking into our life. We have to see and we have to accept what others see in us. And we have to have the courage to believe it'll work out. And if it doesn't, something else will work out and it's okay. And you just spoke about like creating space in your life. 
I think so many of us try to control so much and keep the risk out so much that we don't leave any room for like poetry in life or for magic in life mm -hmm. or for those twists and turns or those, it's kind of a funny story. And so when you look at these twists and turns, is any part of you wish that you didn't do it? Or is there any part of you where you're just like, it wasn't worth the risk? No, no, no. It's all been worth the risk. And, but, and, but it all makes sense when I, when I step back and sort of observe myself, it all makes sense. Look, my background is in the performing arts. I'm a singer. I am a pianist. I you know, went to Juilliard pre-college and then went to Oberlin conservatory. Like I was a singer, singer, you know? Um, and you know, that, that was sort of my trajectory for a while, but like everything that I've ever done is what I do today. You know, like being up on a stage, speaking to people, being a teacher, right? Um, just being like a, a person who motivates people and makes people happy. You know, that's, you know, except for that one volleyball girl. Uh, and <laughs> yep, except for know, her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will hold a grudge forever. You know, I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> no, I don't forgive her. Anyway, so, um, you know, but I, I do everything that I've been trained to do whether it was like explicit training or whether it was just something that I learned to do by virtue of being a teacher or just like whoever my, what, you know, what my person is, what my, my personality is. I, I do all of that. Like basically I, I get paid to be me, <laughs> um, which is really cool. Like I get to be me. I get to share myself with people, whether it's in sports, um, you know, whether I'm speaking to a corporate audience um, who doesn't know anything about me, um, you know, whether I get to speak with kids who are just learning mountain biking and I, I am not a mountain biker, but I try and I suck, but, <laughs> but it's cool to be able to share that with, with people. I get paid to be me is like, that's going to become, I'm going to, I'm going to have to quote you on that all the time because <laughs> my, my hope is that, is that people could realize that that is even an option, mm. like pursuing your passion and doing it with all of you. And it's worth the risk. It's worth the sacrifice. It's, it's just worth it to double down on you. Mm. Um, but rationally, I don't believe it. A lot of people don't believe it. We see people like you who have done it, but you know, and, and I do it, but it just, doesn't seem real or sustainable. It, it seems seem like it's a, a world for dreamers, right? But you have to dream in order for things to happen. And if you, you know, I, I teach a course in, uh, called passion forward where, you know, it's not just about having a passion, but you've got to, there are a couple of steps, right? You've got to, you know, you've got to have core values. You got to know who you are, right? You have to have skills, right? And if you don't have the skills, you develop the skills, you work on those skills. Some people have lots of natural talent, right? But you still continue to work on those talents and to hone your skills. And so like, it can be done, you know, you can live a life of drudgery. And a lot of people feel like they don't have the choice to not live a life of drud drudgery. And, and some people have fewer choices. I get that. And some people don't have the privilege of being in incredible spaces and like being connected with incredible people and, or writing a blog and having somebody's eyes uh, that can make changes for your life on it, right? But there are always things that we can do. There's always hope is a good thing to have because when you hope, when you have hope, you again, you start making space for things to happen, right? They, I, I was listening to a podcast the other day um, and, and, and it was talking about, you know, let's get, let's, let's actually have high hopes. You know, we, we always, we always like think about not um, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hope too much for this. I'm not just like, my hopes are not high for that. You know, that's not going to happen. Well, it's not going to happen if you don't let it happen. Right. If you don't allow the space in your heart, the space in your life for it to happen, it's not going to happen. Right. And, you know, even if it's five minutes of like changing a habit or doing something different that you haven't done previously, that will lead you in a different direction. Do we know always what the direction will be? Absolutely not. I certainly didn't know. I didn't know where I was going to live. I didn't know how I was going to take care of my, my kid had like really bad health issues. And so I was like, I'm going to have to pay out of pocket. So I'm going to have to make money. So I have to find a way to make money. And so you don't know, but you just, you make it happen by, by, make, by creating uh, new habits, by changing things. Like you don't have to like, you don't have to jump off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> That's 28 feet tall. You know, maybe, maybe your cliff is five feet tall. Maybe it's two feet tall. It's something, right? Something you haven't done. Something that's a little scary. 
um yeah so like i jump into the scary it's 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 hard but but it will absolutely change your life i will take that advice and i hope you do too okay Three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, you need to spot the signs and listen to the people that come into your life. You may be like Myrna, right on the edge of greatness, but you think your thing is just a hobby or it's something that won't last. Now, you may not have a student come into your classroom and tell you to move on like Myrna did, but but deep down, you know that you have a gift that you need to fully commit to. Number two, when you commit to your next thing and create space in your life for it, stuff just starts to happen. You create more room in your mind for opportunities, more time to chase things down. And honestly, I can tell you from my own experience that as scary as it is, slowing down and pulling back will actually help you go further faster. And number three, greatest quote of all time, I get paid to be me. Now, you may not be paid, or you may not be there yet, but building a life and a career where you can pursue your passions, you can be lifted up and accepted, and yes, even paid to do what you love as you, as the real you, it's possible. Myrna, the most unlikely ultra runner in the world, has built a life and career around combining her passions with her gifts, with her past experiences, and all of that. If she can do it, you can do it too. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we're not just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. You have got to hear how this world record setting Olympic athlete could win silver medals and yet still feel like a failure for not getting gold. But more importantly, what she did to fight back from that crushing defeat. Click on the video right over there for another real inspiring story.